A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is great to have you with us. Hope you enjoyed your weekend on the uh, program here in just a matter of minutes. Dr. Miguel Faria, MD, is going to be with us. He has a new book out uh, all about the uh, supposed public health crisis uh, that is gun ownership in this country. Yeah, Uh, but let's get started with some headlines, shall we? So Politico reporting today that uh, uh, infighting at the White House is uh, delaying into decision by President Donald Trump uh, when it comes to gun control. And it appears as if the uh, infighting may be a, a bit of a family matter as well. On one side, you've got uh, the Attorney General William Barr and Ivanka Trump, who are uh, pushing for expanded background checks, according to Politico. On the other side, Don Trump Jr. and uh, a gentleman, Michael Williams, who is a counsel for Mick Mulvaney, Uh, who are both pushing against the idea of uh, any new gun control laws. Uh, Will we see this week the president unveil any official uh, gun control agenda or action items that have the blessing of the White House? That remains very much an open question. Uh, This was supposed to be accomplished a couple of weeks ago, but the uh, president has said, we're taking it slow. We want to make sure that we get it right. I want to make sure that we respect the Second Amendment. It does look as if the administration is uh, focused right now on uh, background checks uh, of of some nature. The uh, plan that was floated by the Attorney General, William Barr, uh, to expand background check requirements to all private commercial sales went over like a lead balloon on uh, Capitol Hill last week. So they're back to the drawing board at the White House. And again, what, if anything... Uh, the president ends up supporting remains very much uh, an open question. Out in California, a uh, college student at Sacramento State is uh, a little ticked off after his car was vandalized, he says, because of his pro-Second Amendment stickers. Uh, Jose Aguilar did not park on campus. It's important to note that uh, one salient fact. Instead, he parked in a neighborhood a couple of blocks uh, off of campus there at uh, Sacramento State. Said he parked actually uh, right in front of a church. When he came back, uh, the words killer and bitch had been keyed uh, into the side of his Nissan Versa. He says that uh, he's going to get his car repaired, but the bumper stickers are coming down because he doesn't want that to happen again. So I've got a question for you. You can uh, email me. Uh, at cam.edwards at bearingarms.com. Uh, we'll post this on our uh, Twitter feed as well, at Cam and Company. Have you ever had your car vandalized because of pro Second Amendment stickers? Have you ever uh, thought about taking stickers off of your car or decided not to put stickers on your car because you were afraid of what might happen? Uh, in my story for uh, Bearing Arms, I noted that uh, probably, I guess this was almost seven years ago now, when uh, my wife and I first bought our farm outside of Farmville, Virginia, I was still working in the D.C. area. And so for about a year and a half, I ended up commuting. I, I went home on the weekends, occasionally would uh, drive home on a weeknight. But I actually rented a little 10 by 10 foot room in a townhouse in Alexandria, Virginia. And I stayed up there uh, most of the week. And then I'd drive home on the weekends. Living in Alexandria, a deep blue Uh, city in Virginia, I was a little concerned about my pro Second Amendment stickers. I ultimately decided against taking them off. I thought, you know, if if anybody ends up keying my car or doing anything to my car, I I, I guess I'll deal with that then. But I'm not going to proactively uh, silence myself because I am concerned about what the reaction might be. And I honestly, I didn't have any trouble uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, which was good. I actually noticed I ended up noticing the other cars in, in the neighborhood where I was living uh, that also had pro segment of stickers. All right, well, that, that's good to know. Even, even in deep blue Alexandria, you can still find some Second Amendment support, and I was uh, pleased to see that. Uh, now, uh, today at the Museum in Washington, D.C., well, first of all, trying to get to the Museum in Washington, D.C. this morning, kind of a pain in the neck because uh, climate change activists were Uh, trying to hashtag shut down D.C., blocking off major traffic arteries. While this is taking place, the American Public Health Association 
is holding a symposium at the museum in downtown D.C. Uh, all about uh, things that reduce violence. Yeah. Uh, things that work, they say, to reduce gun violence. And, you know, they say it's all about gun control. All about gun control. Not a, a single idea that I heard dealt with actually focusing on the perpetrators of violent crime. And no, it's all about reducing the number of firearms in circulation and reducing the number of legal gun owners as well. Now, my guest today has a very different take on the subject. Dr. Miguel Faria, MD, is the author of several books, including a new one that's coming out October the 1st that takes a look and delves deeply into the idea that uh, gun violence is a public health epidemic. Take a look and a listen. Dr. Faria, it is so good talking with you again. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today. I'm happy to be here. You've got a new book coming out in uh, just about a little bit more than a week here called America, Guns, and Freedom, A Journey into Politics and the Public Health and Gun Control Movements. Boy, what a timely uh, book this is because, you know, we've got all kinds of gun control advocates proclaiming that uh, gun violence is a public health epidemic and the only way to address it uh, is through more gun control laws. Do you agree? I disagree. I disagree. In fact, that is the reason that, as I recount in my book, that I have joined this movement for more fairness uh, in the gun control debate. Uh, I was uh, editor of the Medical Association of Georgia Journal uh, in the early 1990s, and I found that uh, I was being pushed to promote what the AMA, and the, which is organized medicine, and the public health establishment was promulgating, which was exactly what you said, uh, that gun violence is a public health issue and that the only way to uh, stop the tie of violence was to restrict gun ownership. And the only papers that were published in the medical journals have to have the preordained conclusion that well, easy gun availability led to more crime, homicides, and, and that uh, guns were virus, were viruses that needed to be eradicated. And uh, when I, you know, opposed this, I was, uh, you know, became a, you know, a problem for the Medical Association of Georgia. Uh, I felt that we should discuss both sides of the gun control debate. And if good papers came out, uh, with the, with different conclusions, and they were well written and passed the same scrutiny as those promulgate, promulgating gun control, that they should be published. And my editorial board agreed with me, but the rest of the leadership of the Medical Association of Georgia were embarrassed that I would be willing to promote uh, fairness in the debate. And, uh, of course, that, that all of that is discussed in my book. Uh, eventually, I had to resign uh, from the Medical Association of Georgia because of this having promoting fairness in medical journalism. Well, and was it, it, I'm sorry, it, I, I hate to interrupt, but I want to go back to something that you said, uh, talking about the way that this is framed here. Um, because when we hear that phrase, you know, gun violence as a public health epidemic. Uh, people might not understand what that really means, but, but again, it's not that they're focusing on the perpetrators of violent crime as that quote-unquote disease vector, uh, right? They don't see the, the small number of gang members, for instance, who are driving crime in, uh, in major American cities uh, and say, all right, we've got to treat uh, those individuals because they're, the, they're the, you know, the folks that are spreading this disease. Instead, they view every firearm, including the hundreds of millions of firearms that are legally owned in this country, they view the gun as the disease vector. And so the only way to treat, quote unquote, gun violence as a public health uh, epidemic is to go after all of the guns out there, including uh, those legally owned firearms in this country. You're absolutely correct. Exactly correct. And, and, you know, guns are inanimate objects. And as I discuss in my book, from a biological standpoint, uh, they, they cannot reproduce like viruses do. They don't follow Cox's postulates of pathogenicity, 
which you have to follow as a as a doctor of medicine or a public health uh, official to uh, trace, uh, you know, uh, guns and uh, viruses are very different things. Guns, uh, you know, you have to pull the trigger. And the per person responsible is the one that needs to be evaluated. Are they criminals or are they mentally ill? They are misusing firearms. But instead of addressing that specific problem, they want to restrict gun ownership to the law-abiding citizens. Uh, it, it, it just, it doesn't make sense. It's absurd. And this has happened because science is not what is behind this movement in public health. It's not science. It's ideology and profit. If you read some of the uh, conclusions of the public health papers, public health establishment, they have two characteristics. Number one, they have the preordained result that gun Guns are bad, that they promote crime, and that they should be restricted. The easy gun, that easy gun availability, remember that term because they love that, mm -hmm. uh, either results in homicides or suicide. And that's number one. The second conclusion always is that more studies are needed, and more, which means we want more money. We want more money to continue conducting research. So, you know, they got a ideological self-interest as well as a financial self-interest. Now, they are very quick. If, if a private researcher, in the, let's say in the pharmaceutical company, have a study about different drugs and decide that this drug is effective, they go back and they say, well, this person was linked to the pharmaceutical industry, therefore his research is not valid and they castigate that person. But when they are asking for more taxpayers' money for pseudoscience and for pseudo-research, they don't see the connection that that is a financial self-interest to ask for more studies, for, which means we want more money, more funding, and they don't see the, the, the self-interest. It's a double standard, and we need to stress that because until the Congress restricts more and more the amount of money going to the public health establishment for this junk science, then they will continue to push for those two things. Well, of course, gun control and advocates, I, they want they want the opposite, right? They say, oh, the CDC hasn't studied this issue in years and years. We have so much catch-up work <laughs> to do. We're going to need a huge influx of federal tax dollars. We're going to need to fund dozens of these studies. I mean, they're going in the opposite direction, Dr. Faria. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And they don't, they don't, they, you know, they ignore this. This is what, I, you know, even in scientific papers, we point out the errors in methodology, the, the non sequitur logic, the methodological errors that they continue to make, and they ignore the criticism, like Arthur Kellerman. You know, in 1986 and then in 1993, two studies in the New England Journal of Medicine claiming that a gun in the house is more likely to result in the death of a family member than an intruder. Well, both of those studies, many, several of us scholars have debunk the study, and yet the media have picked up this, and they use it, and the public health establishment as well, they con continue to use this canard to try to prohibit gun ownership in, in law-abiding citizens. And they, they ignore our criticism. Well, finally, I am proud to say, and I recount this in my book, that I was one of four people who testified to a, sub, a congressional subcommittee in 1996 that resulted in they losing uh, money and and for co Congress passed the Dickey Amendment that restricted, it did not really ban research. Mm -hmm. That is another canard. What we did, what we, well, actually, we wanted to do more than that, but what Congress did was to restrict gun research that was biased, that was preordained, that was politicized, and that always resulted in gun control, and that it was not scientific. 
show me the science, basically, Congress said. And you're not showing us science. Therefore, we're going to uh, pass this restriction. And Arthur Kellerman, for example, that was another thing that happened. He was defunded because we showed that his research was biased, was not based on science. That, uh, and I am proud that I was one of four, along with Dr. Timothy Wheeler and uh, Dr. William Waters and with a criminologist Don P. Case. Uh, and I am happy to say uh, that, that those restrictions remain in, pla in place even though, as you know, you remember Obama, President Obama wanted to uh, bypass Congress, and yep. Congress refused. And uh, we must applaud Congress that they so stood firm in preserving this restriction. And now they are starting again since the House is, is in the hands of the Democrats. They want to promote this more money. They want to resume uh, passing pseudoscience junk science of, from, of having the public help do more research which results in gun control and that it's not scientific. We're talking to give us a, Dr. Miguel Faria, and it's, it's interesting, Dr. Faria, you know, as we're talking today, uh, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, is hosting a uh, half-day seminar, half-day forum uh, at the museum in Washington, D.C. called Policies That Work to reduce gun violence. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've got a bunch of speakers. Uh, I noticed that you're not on the uh, invite list there. Um, one of the speakers is a, a woman named Cassandra Cravasi. She is a, a PhD who works at uh, the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. And, you know, she was quoted a few months ago in a uh, BuzzFeed story talking about gun licensing and how. Uh, gun licensing, particularly she, she noted Massachusetts's uh, gun licensing law. She says what those licensing laws do is prevent, and she was very uh, laudatory of this. She, she, she thought this was a good idea. She said that the gun licensing laws, particularly the really restrictive ones like Massachusetts, where you got to jump through all these hoops and hurdles, and then you can be denied for any reason or no reason whatsoever. She says that has a inhibiting uh, effect that some law-abiding gun owners, some people who or not even law-abiding gun owners, but some law-abiding citizens of Massachusetts uh, who wouldn't ever do anything wrong with a firearm, that they are prevented from acquiring a firearm because they say, I don't want to go through the hassle. It's too much of a burden. Uh, and again, she says that's a good thing because it ultimately reduces the number of firearms that are out there. Uh, it has that, you know, trickle down effect uh, into violent criminals. So again, another example of focusing on legal gun ownership, seeing a constitutional right uh, as a public health problem. Uh, last question for you, and I'd love to have you back, by the way, after your book comes out uh, October the 1st. Um, but, but, you know, are we going, are you worried that we're going backwards uh, right now? I mean, you talk about some of the things that you were doing back in the 1990s. Uh, do you feel like uh, you know, like the medical associations, like big health or big health care uh, is, is putting its thumb now on the, the scale in favor of gun control uh, in this debate that we're currently having. Well, they, they are doing more than tilting the scale. They are stepping on the scale and be, because they're not using science. And, you know, they, that follows the rule number one that I told you that you have to lead, whether it's a conference, whether it's a pamphlet, whether it's a gun research, I put that in quote, study, they all have to have the preordained conclusion that gun availability, even in the law-abiding citizens, results in crime, results in more gun violence, and that guns have reached an epidemic proportion where they need to be eradicated because this is a public health issue. And it is not. It is, if it was public health, they will show the science. They are not showing the science. Uh, and, you, you know, it's interesting, though, that Timothy Wheeler, and I discussed this, I even illustrated this because my book is heavily illustrated, uh, a debate that he had with Tom Kassir, the, uh, the editor at, at the time of the New England, New England Journal of Medicine. And there he you know, it stated that no data was necessary, basically, and that assault, assault weapons 
were uh, bad and they need to be eradicated. There's no doubt of which need about this. And that uh, he claimed that this was, you know, it was not good peer-reviewed scientific research. And Dr. Timothy Willis showed the pamphlet uh, on, uh, you know, on television showing that they, basically it was propaganda. And, and they now, since uh, the House is in the control by the Democrats, they are promulgating to return to those days in which public health was getting a lot of money for gun research, which is nothing but gun control propaganda. And like I say, the only way we're going to stop this tide is to Congress to continue with the restrictions and to decrease the amount of money that is going to public health establishments. And, it, you know, Bloomberg has now put a lot of money in, into gun control, some of it going to the public health. Well, you know, the John Hopkins uh, School of Public Health is named after him. Yeah. And you can't expect that the, the research is going to be done there and the articles that have come from there are all biased with the same preordained conclusion. And uh, we must, I think we all need to be aware that this is not scientific and uh, we need to oppose this because they are subverting science. And again, I go into that in my book. This is the subversion of science. And when science is subverted, uh, for a, for an interest, for a political interest, that is very dangerous because it leads to tyranny. And uh, we know what happened in the last century where collectivist government, all left-wing government, killed more than 100 million people of their own country in peacetime uh, to be able to control the population. And it's too bad that so many millennials are not aware, they're not being taught the uh, history and what happened in the last century. Otherwise, they would all be rejecting uh, socialism. And uh, history is very important. And I go into some chapters in this in my book. Uh, and we need to oppose the use of science for political propaganda. That's all we can expect from the public health establishment. Dr. Miguel Faria, the book is America, Guns, and Freedom, A Journey into Politics and the Public Health and Gun Control Movements. Uh, again, sir, it is so good talking with you today. I hope we get a chance to do this again very soon, and congratulations on the new book. Let's get to today's Armed Citizen story. We've got our good deed of the day, and of course, we have another failure of the criminal justice system, uh, this time around in Massachusetts. Yes, home of uh, all kinds of great gun control laws, or so we were told by gun control advocates, but uh, a criminal justice system that is awfully, uh, awfully light on crime. In this case, a, a 19-year-old uh, who is now charged with murder, who is also well-known to police, uh, 19-year-old Vadim Misurik. Uh, pleading not guilty on Friday to killing a uh, high school student, Nazar Koch. Uh, Miserick, according to authorities, admitted that he blacked out after Koch uh, called him a racial slur while the two were in a park on uh, Wednesday evening in Westfield, Massachusetts. In uh, court documents, police say Miserick essentially admitted to cutting Koch's throat on Wednesday uh, and slicing a piece of the victim's body off in an attempt to try to destroy evidence. Uh, ordered held without bail by the judge, and as uh, WesternMassNews.com points out, Ms. Rick has heard that from a judge before. Last October, less than a year ago, Ms. Rick was ruled too dangerous to be released on bail after he was arrested for reportedly hitting a man. Uh, documents went on to say that Ms. Rick also spit on and punched four Westfield police officers who came to the scene, punched a police dog, even. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Other documents show that weeks before that arrest, Mr. was detained for reportedly grabbing a woman in Westfield, Massachusetts. Uh, he's due back in court on October the 4th now. There's no word on what actually happened in that case from last October when he was deemed to be too dangerous to be released on bail, and yet he's back out onto the street. So clearly something happened. He was released on bail. The charges were dropped. Uh, we don't know the outcome of that case. But what we do know is that uh, Ms. Rick was, again, back out on the streets. Uh, and now stands accused of a uh, even more deadly attack. All right, let's get to uh, our armed citizen story of the day from the great state of Texas. 
And a, a great story from uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, uh, News Channel 6. Uh, that man in the mugshot, uh, 26-year-old Angel Christopher Solorzano, who's now been charged with aggravated robbery after an attempt to steal the donation bucket. Yeah, from a disabled volunteer. Uh-huh, even worse. Uh, who was picking up donations from a gas station. Happened Thursday, September 19th, in the uh, afternoon hours. Uh, Wichita Falls Police had dispatched to a Love's uh, travel stop in reference to an aggravated robbery. Uh, once they got there, they spoke with the victim who said she was inside the store collecting money for the Children's Miracle Network when she was approached by Solorzano, who asked the victim for information about where he might be able to purchase a bus ticket to Fort Worth. While the victim was answering uh, Solorzano, he reached down, grabbed the donation bucket from her lap, She's in a wheelchair. She doesn't have full use of her arms. And then he tried to run from the store. This is where it gets good. Uh, According to News Channel 6, a witness on the scene chased Solorzano around the store and then onto a nearby access road uh, where that witness confronted Solorzano and told him to return the money to the victim, at which time, according to police, Solorzano then threw a backpack at the witness and hit them in the face with his fist. So Lozano then pulled a knife and told the witness to, quote, back up. He then continued to run down the access road and was again confronted by two separate witnesses, according to News Channel 6. One of those witnesses, an armed citizen and a concealed carry holder, who ended up holding Mr. Solorzano at gunpoint until police arrived on scene. What's that they say about not bringing a knife to a gunfight. So Lozano had about $60 in loose crumpled bills. He was taken into custody where he was charged with one count of aggravated robbery. Uh, 60 bucks is what he tried to take. He is right now in the Wichita County Jail in lieu of $50,000 bond. Doesn't seem worth it to me. There you go. All right. And uh, finally, our good deed of the day from the great state of Oklahoma and a Facebook post from the Oklahoma Highway Patrol uh, talking about uh, Trooper Michael uh, Padnada. I believe that's how you pronounce Michael's name. Michael Padnada. Uh, he was at the on gas station in Oklahoma City at uh, 36th in May. I, I know exactly where that is. I live just a couple of miles away from there. This was uh, a week ago. This was last Monday. He heard a woman scream that her daughter was not breathing. So uh, Trooper Pagnata uh, immediately ran to her, took the child, uh, placed her on the ground, started chest compressions. By the time the ambulance arrived, she had opened her eyes. She had uh, started breathing again, as the Oklahoma Highway Patrol says. So very grateful. He was in the right place at the right time to help that little girl. Well, there you go, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Trooper Pagnata, we appreciate Your good deed, sir. And that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. We appreciate you being a part of the program as always. If you like the uh, show in a podcast form, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Stitcher, townhall.com podcasts as well. You can subscribe to Town Hall Media and you can get the latest episodes on uh, YouTube each and every day as well. Thank you again for being a part of the program. Have a great rest of your Monday. We'll see you back here soon with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company.